Hi everybody, welcome to uh, World War One, Part One, Part Two. <laughs> so I know Part One, Part Two works, but you know what I'm talking about. We're still doing the the first kind of chapter on World War Two, and then uh, I didn't want to make that video too long, the previous one, so I stopped it. So this is the tail end of that video. So, all right, uh, let's pick up where we left off. We just got up the reasons for German success, the Lightning War. Now, success means we're talking early part of the war, so we don't want to be historically inaccurate. It's not going to work out for Germany long term, to say the least. Um, but they were quite successful early in the war, and so it's useful for us to look at why is that. Um, now, equally important, a good look later on, why did they fail? And justly so, for many, many reasons. Above all, the moral arc of the universe. Um, but it's important to look at, so why were they successful at the start? And that's uh, where we pick up, right, the lightning. So, well, in the war, they were very successful. So, what's going on there? So, there's a lot of reasons. Um, like most things, is there's a multiple of uh, causes, not simply just one. But they do have a lot, very long military tradition. Uh, Germany did prize the military ethics going all the way back to Prussian history. There had been emphasis on order and discipline and a lot of the, kind of the hallmarks we think of military qualities or traditions that are instrumental in military success and German society prized a lot of those culturally. So in a sense our society that uh, has a greater comfort with warfare in a sense and a greater cultural affinity for attributes that make you successful in warfare, at least in the short run. <laughs> now they have some downsides too obviously, not mention the humanity of it, but uh, Germany had aggressively rearmed uh, they had a lot of modern weapons, of course, that's, but that's not unique, actually, the countries are fighting, for example, Great Britain and France also have many modern weapons, so that's, that's not really a, a major reason, but they had rearmed. Um, they are very motivated, that certainly is true, they are very motivated, their memories of World War I left to feel bitter, as you guys know, feel they are betrayed, stabbed in the back by Jewish Bolshevism and a whole series of liberal democrats and socialists, etc. So, uh, they're motivated, they, they feel like they got a raw deal and they want payback. Um, they want a righting of wrongs, as they, as they would view. I would say payback, but it's righting of wrongs. Um, they are the ones taking the initiative. They're the, the active uh, decider in the early war. And so the one, in a sense, calling the shots and the allies tend to be very reactive. Um, their new method of warfare, which we talked about in the previous lecture, the Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. It's the new generation style warfare. Um, they're very mobile, rapid. It's just it's a game changer, as you guys, as we all know. And uh, Germany, uh, in the early part of the war, is the best at this new pot style warfare. Now again, the Allies are going to catch up, so that's not a one off. But uh, but at, at a start, though, they are certainly have a leg up on that because of the best in the world at that in the early stage of that. And also, the Allies are not sure what to do. Um, they're confused, and that leads also to indecision and leads to mistakes and vulnerability to Germany in the early period of the war, which Germany is quite well. This map right here is useful for a couple reasons. Again, it just shows you German expansion, uh, rapid expansion, and in places they attacked, you can see the German expansion into Poland, obviously. Uh, uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, Albania, Italy, those are our natural allies. Um, Former Yugoslavia, you, I mean, not serious. Czechoslovakia, which no longer exists. Of course, that would be right here. Now that's considered an ally. The Czechs are not asked about their feelings about that. Of course, you guys know that's been sub subjugated. Now, remember, don't don't forget though that Russia also has uh, claimed additional territory during this time period. Uh, remember, that Russia took Eastern Ukraine. They also took the Baltic states and the Winter War. As you guys remember, they seized parts of Finland. And you see it pushed down into Romania as well, too. So Russia has also been active. Now, in, in Stalin's eyes, perhaps this is to create a protective border area. And there's probably historic, you know, discussion, controversy over exactly why Stalin threw this. Well, I better stop that. I was doing that last night, too, in my previous lecture. And they get a drink of water and cool water. So... <laughs> But in any case, Russia also expanding, and the reason why that's significant is um, 
these countries also are going to, in many cases, fall under the sphere of the Cold War after the war. Uh, the people in those territories are, are going to have a history, a history of Russian uh, forced occupation of them and their desire not to have that happen. Um, so keep in mind, currently Finland joining NATO. The Baltic states are already in NATO because they have long memories uh, of things in the Cold War. But prior to the Cold War, and this would be a very important part of it, would be Soviet seizure of these uh, nations and territories prior to the German invasion of, of the Soviet Union during World War II. That's a little important to talk about what was Hitler's goal for all this. We're talking about what he's doing, but what is his vision for this? And that is the Third Reich. The Third Reich, or the Thousand Year Reich, is also used the term. The Third Reich is, uh, is Hitler's vision of Germany finally coming into its true nature. The First Reich would be the area of Charlemagne, which he tried to claim. The second one is going to be. I'm drawing a blank on the second one. It'll come to me, but let's keep moving. But the Third Reich is, again, this kind of, again, a kind of mystical sense of Germany finally coming into its ultimate, even they even say divine destiny. What you see there on the left is Albert Speer's model of what would be essentially the, the assembly of the German peoples or their legislature, capital building, would be this structure right here. Now, it looks like a massive dome on a smaller building, and I guess that's what it was. By the way, the size of this building would have been massive. In line with Hitler's ambition and his glorious vision of this tower, a thousand year Reich, and it dominating all of Europe. So you're going to have to have this magnificent um, reconstruction of the civic portion of Berlin to match its new importance as the new, I guess, almost like the new Rome, going back to Roman Empire. Berlin being the new Rome of this new Germanic uh, empire that dominates much of the world and all of Europe. And you have to have some very grand, imposing capital building, uh, capital buildings, by the way, to, to show that. Now, most of these buildings were never built. Uh, they did work on a few of them, but the war intervened. So most of these remain simply models and ideas on paper. But the size of them was extraordinary. Albert Sears' model of that building gives you an idea of just how massive that building would have been. I was looking for some images there. That's why I paused the video really, really briefly there to show you uh, a scale or give you some idea of how am extraordinarily ambitious or comically unrealistic their ideas of how large the building was going to be. I know modern architects said that the dome was so large, it would have had its own internal weather system. <laughs> I don't know what that means a lot, but it sounds like incredibly massive. So it would have been vastly bigger than any other national capital you and I can conceive of, uh, for example, like the U.S. Capitol building. It would have been infinitely larger than that, than that structure, in line with German uh, Hitler's extraordinary fantasy ambitions. Uh, again, this is the, the German, the German idea, the Nazi idea. I shouldn't German, the Nazi idea of this kind of pure race Germanic people are now going to dominate all of Europe because they're this kind of divinely ordered, designed master race. You guys know that term, master race. And of course, here's kind of embodiment. You see these young women and this uh, German league for girls. Again, kind of the this mo ideal motherhood, womanhood in the in the Nazi conception, saying for for the male, uh, for manhood, these, these Nazi conceptions of what that's like. And that is this kind of general mystical vision of this dominant Germanic people that can control all of Europe, perhaps the globe itself, uh, and they're going to be in the driver's seat in all things because they are the great race. So that plans, of course, means conquer first Europe and then more distant, maybe the entire world. Now, since there is one master race, what about all these people who are occupying the land who are in the way, say in Eastern Europe, Africa, other places. And here's a part of uh, the Nazi philosophy that's incredibly important for us to understand. Um, I think oftentimes we naturally folks tend to get focused on the, the darkest aspect, aspects of the, of the Nazi program, Hitler's mass race ideology, would be the Holocaust. And that's not wrong. 
but the Holocaust really is step one. A, a, a insane, dark nightmare is step one, but there's more steps into that nightmare. And that is a general conception that these racially, biologically subspecies of humanity, the Slavs in general in Eastern Europe, um, Africans, etc., that they are simply occupying land um, as a subspecies that at best they're a useful nuisance that you could put to work for German goals. But probably a better end would be that they will no longer be a breathing life, life form on Earth at some point. So the general Germanic Nazi philosophy, Aryan Nazi philosophy, is at some point Whenever there's a collision between the needs of the German right, whether for land, resources, security, etc., that these these peoples in the way are going to be ethnically cleansed, perhaps outright genocide against them. And that would be entire ethnic groups. So this map you see on the left shows German occupation of nearly all of Western Europe and then pushing into Eastern Europe too, in the Soviet Union. And if you look carefully, you can see these areas are being divided up. Some of them are divided up as an uh, area for German colonists to move to. For example, we saw this in Ukraine. I wish we had more time in Ukraine to go into that. But uh, the, the, the German Nazi view of the Ukrainians is they're Slavs. They can care less the Ukrainian national aspirations. They're willing to not be part of the Russian Empire. Germans could care less. That means nothing to them outside perhaps some useful Machiavellian employment of that nationalist desire as you saw a bit in our, in our lecture on uh, World War II in Ukraine. But at the end of the day, the Germans don't really care. I don't see really much difference at all between the, the Ukrainians and the Russians. They're both Slavs. Both of them, again, at best, are perhaps a useful workforce for employing of Nazi aims. But even as a long-term workforce, probably is not really the goal. The goal is probably at some point they're moved off. Perhaps they die. Perhaps you speed up their dying by direct state action, as in a genocide. Thus making the world free and open to the Germanic race to expand out as they need. You see that cover there of that uh, Nazi magazine. This racially pure Aryan couple. So, practically, what does that mean? World domination. World domination... Um, in the short run, obviously, it means going after uh, Eastern Europe and others and making sure they win the war. Eventually, there were plans to perhaps attack the United States. Again, Germany's a little bit hazy on some of that. Uh, but no question, they're planning to have a European centered Nazi empire that's dominant in the world. And to achieve that as a byproduct of that, genocide of many of the world's non Aryan peoples. Slavs, for example, most long-term long excuse me, long -term Nazi plans call for the Slavic people within two or three generations to be essentially extinct. So that's why I mentioned that the, the nightmare and the horror of the Holocaust is but the beginning of the complete de descent into inhumanity, which is a Nazi's long-term goal. The numbers would have escalated dramatically when you start looking at genocide of entire ethnic groups, in this case, the Slavic people down the road. See an example of that? And actually, I need to go back and check this because I think that photograph is actually not correct. I do not believe that's Bobby Yar after all. The, the horrific picture you see on the left of a, of a Eisengruppen mass killing or, or action or act on uh, was not Bobby Yar, I believe, but, but was in Ukraine. And it's probably that town, I think I was mentioning to you guys in the Ukrainian lectures, uh, I think this is mislabeled. That's because of emerging scholarship, by the way, because some of these notes I worked on, some of these are just recently worked on yesterday. But some of these things have come from a while back. And so I think when I got that picture initially on the left, it had been mislabeled. But later researchers show that is not Bobby Yar. But it was an Eisengruppen killing in Ukraine. Perhaps in a sense, it does not matter. The inhumanity and cruelty of it is the same. Same thing for this photograph right there. I'm not sure, and I don't believe it's probably Bobby Yar on the left, where you see German soldiers going from person to person. Although, it could be. Whatever the case may be, it is in Ukraine, 
and is a killing field for men, women, children are gunned down by the Eisen Group and now some of soldiers are walking on the bodies, over the bodies, looking for those who perhaps have not yet died to finish them off with a pistol shot. There will be more to come. My, my point of showing you those photographs is that is but the beginning of an incredibly a bloody claw of, of the Nazis' profound inhumanity, uh, and that's the Holocaust. But it would have extended far beyond that in numbers exponentially had they won the war and carried out their plans of ethnic genocide. So that's a nice segue into keeping in mind the reality of, uh, of the and the context of the struggle fascism in the 20th century. And of course, you guys got a really good indication of that as you guys are reading in your textbook, Source of European History, and of course, Tom Rick's a Churchill and Orwell. And both Orwell and, and Churchill seen the, the profound threat to humanity posed by fascism. And neither Churchill or Orwell is probably focused on, like, for example, the Holocaust and so forth. But that's not their, but they're just looking at a complete Nazi of thought, freedom of thought, freedom of any kind of action of, of the individual. Religion would be part of that, because obviously Judaism would be part of that. Um, and that brings to mind uh, the Netflix series, maybe some of you guys have seen this, uh, Man in the High Castle, which is a counterfactual kind of historic, I don't know, sci-fi, metaphysical, I don't know how you would describe it, but uh, show in which in this alternate reality, uh, Germany and Japan win World War II, the Germans occupy the eastern and central portion of the United States and Japan occupies the west coast and what that would look like and uh, I watched I think one of the first season start the second season got busy and, and finish it but man chilling maybe some of you guys have seen it man high castle incredibly chilling to see it's a picture in America of the, of the Nazi program Japanese totalitarianism uh, in route uh, inside the United States and Americans joining the Nazi Party actively uh, for euthanasia program to be enacted in in America. Remember one of the first episode, I think, one of the main characters who's on a mission for the for a, a Nazi SS officer, this guy right here, he's on a mission for him, stops in a small town on a secret mission. They get a flat in the truck he was driving, remember the storyline, right? And he stops, the local cop pulls up. Uh, and the local cop is offering to help change one of the, the flat tire on the truck. And as they're chatting, two of them notice that even though it's a nice sunny day, but there's ash falling around them. And uh, the guy who's the main character, who in the court of the story, he's from New York City or something like that, uh, asks the local cop, like, what's going on here? What, what's, this, what's this ash coming down? And the local cop just casually says, oh, it's a certain day at the, at the you know, uh, obviously the orphanage over there or the old folks home. But anyways, people are being euthanized because, according to Nazi ideology, they're not a productive member of this biological unit, which is Aryanism. And they have some defect, some illness, something that neither the Nazi philosophy compromises them. And so that they have been gassed, and now their bodies are being cremated. And the ash falling is the remains of their bodies coming down on this road as this guy is changing his tire. And he gets back in his truck and drives off. And you watch that scene, I thought, man, it's so affecting how powerful that scene is. The stakes involved uh, when you look at the heart of darkness, which is uh, Nazism and Japanese fascism as well. All right. There's not too much left in this lecture, so let's get to the last part here. Um, following defeat of Germany in an attempt to invade England, uh, Hitler, as he really for a long time, all the way back to my coffin earlier, turns to the massive Soviet Union as a place full of land for potential German settlers, um, a place of immense resources, and uh, Germany sides and, and Hitler sides. As we have planned for a long time, now it's time to seize uh, the Soviet Union and incorporate that in, into the German Reich, and uh, that is their war against Russia. That was launched June 22, 1941. I'll go all the way to the end of the war, May 45, uh, end of World War II in Europe. If you were in Russia taking this class, you call this the Great Patriotic War, and uh, you would spend half the semester on this. <laughs> I don't know. It might be fair, Russian. They fight extremely hard, took terrible, terrible losses in this war. 
I, I understand why they call it the Great Patriot War. In fact, I'm fine with that title from the Russian perspective. That certainly is the case because they face an existential threat to their very survival fame facing Nazi Germany. It's no wonder the Russians fought with such dogged determination and self-sacrifice to expel the Germans because there's, there's, there's all kinds of defeats. But this defeat would have been catastrophic for the probably the, the, the long-term very survival of any kind of Russian pressure. I'm not talking about who's, what flag gets outside your house, outside the capital, but I'm talking your very survival as a people likely was at stake. There's a famous called German Operation Barbarossa, which is the name the Nazis gave to the invasion of Russia. Initially, it went very, very well. So in the first couple of months, the German invasion, the Bina Blitzkrieg was outstanding. Stalin's army, due to the part of the purges, uh, and that's a couple, couple lectures ago, but the purges had gotten rid of a lot of talented Soviet army officers, high-level officers. The Russian military was not as reflective and responsive as it should have been. And in the early days, um, massive victories for Germany. But Russia does have some advantages, which is its massive size and massive population. So despite some really devastating early losses by the Red Army um, and German, Germany's rapid advance into the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet Union is massive, um, hundreds and hundreds of miles ago. And uh, the Russian army is resilient, even despite those terrible losses early on. Well, eventually, the German army will bog down in Russia. Why is that? There's a lot of reasons, but you see vast geographic size of Russia. Fierce Russian resistance, obviously. Some poor, mistaken uh, German military decisions. The severity of the Russian winter and uh, German underestimation of Russian strength, numbers, and will to resist. Probably the most important is our will to resist. Uh, perhaps rightly, the Russians see this as a battle for their very survival. Uh, and that means no sacrifice is too great to defeat the planned German invasion. If Hitler would have won, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, likely would have been genocide of the Slavic people of Eastern Europe and Russia specifically. Uh, Hitler despised the Russians, uh, saw them as, again, in many cases, a little more than an animal-like human or a human-like animal. I don't know how, which way you want to go with that. Um, and that has genocidal implications. I should have tanks advancing deeply into Russia. Of course, the Russians' fierce resistance, their size and numbers helps. And uh, I give you encapsulate this, and that'd be the Battle of Stalingrad. So after uh, two years of hard fighting, the German army comes up again to a uh, fiddly named city, Stalingrad. Um, and that city has become synonymous with the savagery, brutality of World War II uh, on the Eastern Front, Russia specifically. Um, both sides see this as a contest of wills. Both the Germans and the Russians pour immense resources into this terrible, nightmarish battle. It takes place from summer or August 42 until February 43. It's a summarized battle in many ways. It becomes a test of will between Hitler and Stalin. I don't think Stalingrad itself, uh, practically the city itself, had that level of significance. But it, it, it becomes that significant because both sides see it that way. And it becomes a tremendous titanic clash of wills where both sides throw more and more men, machines, money, ammunition, everything in an attempt to win this and shift the course of the war. For most of the summer into late fall, the war is primarily Germany hammering on Saul Grand and gradually, house by house, sometimes literally, rub piece of destroy rubble by police rubble. The German army is going to grind its way deeper and deeper in its song by itself, gradually taking more and more control of this just devastated, flattened, rubbleized Russian city as they slowly, through terrible, horrific combat, take more and more of it. And you guys actually have two reads. Well, I can only sign one of them, but you guys have a read uh, for next week, I believe, on Stalingrad. You guys get a little sense of what I'm talking about here um, from a diary of a German soldier there. I don't think I signed the Russian one, but I recommend the Russian one right after that, too, in, your, in a source of European history. But the Russians, uh, while continuing to lose horrific losses in Stalingrad, they have some talented Russian generals, General Zhukov, most importantly, 
who sees opportunity here because the Germans are so intense, so obsessed with wrestling, wrestling the city of Stalgrat away from Stalin that they no longer are spending much time and care to their flanking positions on both sides of the front line. And so all the best German soldiers are concentrated in this cauldron of violence in, this, in the rubble, the flaming rubble of Stalgrad. But on both sides, of it, they have weaker allied nations like Romania, for example, Bulgaria, soldiers, man the front lines, both the north and south of the fighting there at Stalgrad. The Russians are aware of that, and Zhukov is going to capitalize on that. As we'll see here in a minute. You see some next case, some German soldiers there in the rubble. One looks like a sniper based on the rifle he has there. That is Stalingrad today. You have this massive emblem, emblem or statue or monument to victory there. And we'll, we'll see that sculpture here in minutes ago. Mm. Just the, the, the level of intensity of fighting in Stalingrad is probably hard to surpass that anywhere in World War II. There's other horrific places. But Stalingrad, so intensified, goes on for so long. Boy, it's hard set to say. There's all the other terrible fight in other places too, unquestionably. But uh, it's also a question that Stalingrad probably have to be in the, the very top few of just being the most nightmarish in its quality and it's just its meat grinding nature. I mentioned all the German forces gradually take over most of the city, but Russian forces are waiting for a stunning counteroffensive, which would take place in late 1942. And the Russian armies are able to penetrate both north and south of uh, Songrad and are able to, to shock and surprise the Germans, encircle the German armies inside the western portion of Stalingrad. So the Germans go from the besiegers trying to seize control of all of Stalingrad to following the, this Russian counteroffensive, the, the Germans now being cut off themselves and trapped in the area around Stalingrad, Stalingrad itself. And gradually, despite the attempts by the German shining forces to relieve them, come to the rescue, there will be no rescue for them. And the German pocket of control in Stalingrad and around it is gradually getting ground down day by day in that terrible winter, 1942 to 43, until gradually the running out of food, ammunition, no medicine. And eventually the German army that had come there as conquerors is defeated and has to surrender there in the burned rubble of Stalingrad. The reason why this significance is both sides pour so many men, media attention, psychological will, etc., into this combat that when Russia finally, despite its incredibly high butcher bill, Russia finally wins this titanic struggle, it's seen both practically but also symbolically as a major German reversal and increases Russian confidence but, but shakes German consequence. There's some scenes there from the fighting. You can see it's a little bit. Some German machine gunners advancing into uh, Constantinople. Uh, Constantinople. It's a fortress. Into Stalingrad. And on the right there, you can see some Russian soldiers battling in the trenches that been carved out on the sea streets of Stalingrad. Of course, you don't really have scenes, many scenes of, of, of what perhaps would be more emblematic, which is the terrible combat. So you have to rely on the arts for that. Left, you see German soldiers in a. Uh, in a, a machine factory there in Saul Grand Valley against Russian forces. And on the right, picture of, uh, excuse me, a depiction of Russian soldiers. By the way, if you wonder why I'm yawning so much, I'm working hard for you guys. <laughs> Although not just for this class. All my class has been a very, very busy semester. Uh, this lecture is almost over, by the way. <laughs> uh, but I have really, really enjoyed preparing for this class, lecturing for this class. Um, I wish I could hang out with you guys in a classroom. I know for various reasons this is the best format for you guys. Uh, these topics are so rich, so profound and important. I wish we could do that in person. Um, but I've really enjoyed doing this work, and so don't mistake my yawning for boredom, lack of interest in the topic. That is not the case. <laughs> Just I'm, I'm kind of exhausted and tired. I got a lot going on this semester. It's a whole, whole right. Not, not bad. Most of the good things, but just a lot of heavy work responsibilities, the heaviest of my career, frankly. And uh, so this class, ironically, has been kind of a refuge for me. It's almost like a, like taking candy. <laughs> you guys might not imagine that as you're going through all these lectures and doing the readings, the homework and stuff, but that's how I felt about it. I learned a great deal about Ukrainian history I did not know prior to this class and continue to learn things every semester, including the lecture I'm working on right here. Uh, some of it is 
older material I did years ago, but some of it's brand new and fresh material I've just done. And I continue this whole semester to learn and uh, when I'm in my showers, listen to YouTube of various professors, Stephen Clockin, or, you know, depends who it is. Uh, Adam Beaver, I've listened to him recently, his War of Spain, which I read, and uh, listening to him, I just got a book on his, the war, um, uh, the Russian Revolution and the, and the so Soviet Unions, well, not Soviet Unions, the Russian Revolution and then the succeeding civil war between the Bolsheviks and the whites. And I just got that and then get more and more interested in that as well, too. But in any case, let's finish this lecture off. Hopefully my yawns are done. There's General Zhukov on the right, brilliant Russian general, uh, is a major planner behind that extraordinary victory at Stalingrad, despite the terrible, terrible cost in the fighting there in Stalingrad. Uh, uh, by the way, I have a recommendation for you guys. I should have put it in here. Uh, if you're curious about Stalingrad, in fact, give me one second. I will put it in for you. All right, as promised, I took a little break there and I quickly found some uh, some books to recommend for you guys. But before I do that, I just want to show you the last couple things Jeff Stalingrad. read. That photograph on the left shows uh, some German soldiers. And if it's not on Stalingrad, it sure looks like it should be. And so the German soldiers, both of them look very rough and grizzled in this trench right here. And right immediately behind them is a knocked out Russian tank on top of their trench. I don't know whether that was actually from Stalingrad or not, but it, it certainly is a wonderful visual example of the intensity of fighting that uh, they're still occupying that trench, but right above that trench is a knocked out Russian tank, which obviously is in combat above them as it got knocked out, but you know the ferocity. And the photograph on the right shows a wounded German soldier, looks like he's wearing a lady's fur coat, Badly grizzled and looks like he's wounded, being captured by a Russian. This also being very late in the fight as Stalingrad is falling to the Soviet uh, forces. The books I could recommend to you, I mentioned uh, Anthony Beaver here a few minutes ago, but his book on Stalingrad, probably my first choice. He's a fantastic story, wonderful storyteller, very knowledgeable. Uh, that might be my first choice of those books. But if you guys are curious about that terrible cauldron of violence and death and destruction, by way, of which many civilians were still locked there, they're not allowed to leave. Um, but that probably be my first stop right there is Anthony Bieber's song. And then you have Enemy at the Gates. Perhaps some of you guys have seen the movie um, by William Craig and then Notes of Russian Sniper, which is really in the movie version of Enemy at the Gates, is the hero of Vasily Zaitsev. Um, so that gives also a real good insight into the Russian military, who the Russian heroes, and the great hero of Stalingrad. And finally, a book on the right island and fire, the battle for one of the gun factories there in Stalingrad. Of course, there's many more books on Stalingrad. I just wanted to give you guys a little sample. If you guys are curious and want to learn more, you got to probably start with Anthony Beaver's Stalingrad there on the left. So given Stalingrad, why is it so important? And you can, if you visited Russia today, which... I'd not recommend that right now because the U.S.-Russian relationship is toxic right now, so don't get picked up <laughs> as, a, as a foreign agent in Russia right now. So hold off on this tour of uh, the Stalingrad battlefield until things, hopefully for the entire world, above all for Ukrainians and for Russians too, uh, get much better for all of us. But in any case, if you have a chance to go sometime, and it's on my list, I'd like to go sometime to the battlefield of Stalingrad, you'll see that massive, massive... Uh, sculpture of the motherland calls behind you signifying the extraordinary losses in life there to defend Stalingrad. And when I say extraordinary losses, I think I have some numbers here. Yeah. German casualties, you know, 300, 400,000 are going to die in a total contest there. Quite a few Italians do, Romanians, Hungarians. They're like, what are they doing? But th these are other people who uh, are allies of the Germans fighting there too. Now, importantly, you notice the, that, that Russian casualties are not mentioned there. I mean, although above it, you see total Russian casualties over a million. Now, I mean, casualties doesn't, doesn't mean they all die, right? You have killed and wounded, right? But uh, but killed, close to 500,000 Russians are killed or missing in the fighting there in Stalingrad. And even those numbers probably are not complete. Give you the idea of extraordinary losses. So what that means in losses, Stalingrad, the losses of Russians in Stalingrad, Not quite, but close to double the not total number of KIA of U.S. military personnel in World War II. So one battle. Now, it's not quite double, not quite, but Stalingrad is approaching double the casualties from one battle 
in Russia, and that would include both soldiers and civilians too. But uh, uh, yeah, the idea of some level of extraordinary sacrifices and the terrible, terrible ferocity of fighting there in Stalingrad. That's why, of course, they have that, that massive, massive sculpture there recalling uh, their ultimate the sacrifice and the ultimate victory of Stalingrad. And then other ones like you see real close here too, which also are quite large, but nothing compared to that iconic structure there showing the signifying the total, the climactic losses in life and then also ultimate Russian victory. So here we go, wrap it up here. Songrad, one of the biggest, but he's battles of World War II. There's other big ones too, but Songrad would be up in the top two or three. Germany's massive defeat was an important but military, but probably, perhaps even more psychologically, and proved to be in many ways a turning point in the war. Prior to that, Germany really is still on the offensive in Russia. Now, it is true if you're a real uh, military buff of World War II, the Germans do have another major offensive the next summer, actually. So it's not that this loss ended German offense operations in Russia. German strength is not spent yet. But I would say perhaps their, their belief that the tide is rolling their way in the east uh, was dashed in the terrible hellhole that is known as Stalingrad. Russia did take terrible losses, higher losses than the Germans and their allies. But Russia, I'd say in a horrible way, kind of way, but they can afford more. Uh, the, the, the Russian population is bigger. Uh, Germany has other foes to fight simultaneously, too. And so even though the losses, man for man, uh, is, is worse, and not to mention women and children, because they're dying there, too, is certainly worse uh, on the ledger side for Russia in this war. But again, but they can afford to do that because they swallowed up a whole series of German armies. And although they lost armies, too, their ability to replace them is easier than it is for the Germans. And it will be a great turning point in the war, and I think that's where we'll stop right there. So uh, we'll pick up with World War II Part Two uh, next week, but that's enough for this. So I wish you guys all a good day, and we'll see you uh, with a video next week too. So I uh, recommend those books to you guys, as I mentioned. And with that, uh, take care, everybody.